So welcome everybody. Um, I'm really happy to welcome today Dr. Pedro Perezito from Concordia, uh, who is our seminar speaker in Quantitative Life Sciences seminar series. Dr. Perez Nito uh, did his bachelor's and master's degree in Rio de Janeiro, his PhD in the University of Toronto and a postdoc at the University of Montreal. Uh, he has a Canada Research Chair in Spatial Modeling and Biodiversity, or had one from 2010 to 2016. Uh, and he works in community quantitative ecology. But more than that, he was one of the uh, into people who came and evaluated the Quantitative Life Sciences PhD program on behalf of the province of Quebec when this program was originally launched. And uh, we are very happy to have him invited back as a, uh, as a seminar speaker here today. So please, uh, Pedro, uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Celia. No, it's been confusing. My, I, I, I was a tier two. And then I'm now at tier one, but the, the, the title of the chair hasn't really changed. So ah, okay. it's just not, for some reason, not updated in this year's seat site. Anyways, um, thanks for the invitation, uh, Celia and Alexandra. I was always looking. Unfortunately, your series was always during my lecture time uh, in past years. Uh, this year, not only this semester is over, but my lecture time was changed. So that, that would have worked as well. I just didn't know in the, in the beginning of the semester. So I wanna to talk to you today about um, why, why modeling spatial patterns are important to, uh, to biology in general. So I'll give you a few examples and I'll, I'll try to cover uh, some, some methods in some uh, general ways, uh, but we can definitely have more discussions along the way. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about our lab since we are in, in Montreal and I'm in Montreal as well. And so we, you know, vaguely, we, we try to work with biodiversity data, but using um, very broad and very diverse types of uh, quantitative approaches uh, to understand a number of questions. So our lab is as diverse as you can think in terms of uh, also approaches. And, you know, we develop a lot of math and stats approaches. I'm not gonna get into too much uh, details. Uh, I often uh, prefer to give something that is a little more general in terms of flavors. Uh, there will de be definitely some, uh, you know, I'm gonna mention a few approaches here and there, but uh, I wanted to, uh, it, but obviously if you have interest in more in the intricate part of, of the math uh, and the, the statistics related, uh, we can discuss this uh, anytime in the today or in the future. So as we know, fragmentation, uh, it's an important, uh, it's interesting to think that fragmentation was brought up particularly uh, in the past decades because we know that um, uh, human uh, activities are affecting the way uh, landscapes are configured. But fragmentation is also a very natural process, right? You can have for instance, uh, this looks a very pristine landscape, but you can see that an animal would have maybe some uh, some species or some individuals would have problems in, in, uh, in for instance, going from uh, one side to the other through, through water. But, you know, there's many examples of human fragmentation, but also it's an important natural process. So um, spatial ecologists, the kind of uh, what I sometimes refer to, uh, to my research, we try to understand um, how uh, fragmentation, natural uh, or human driven, but it's spatial ecology, is a, it's an old discipline, but it, it really became quite important because of, um, because of the past uh, decades in, in terms of uh, how uh, human driven processes are affecting uh, natural landscapes. Uh, sorry about this. So uh, what I wanna talk to you today is, you know, how we think about uh, different types of models that we can use to incorporate spatial information and the types of spatial um, um, processes that uh, often uh, it's interesting from, uh, from many different perspectives. Uh, uh, definitely, I'm going to give some examples of my own work, but, but our attempt here is to generalize as much as we can to different types of problems, right? So how do features in landscape limit or promote movement and dispersal? 
So animal movement is important and it's critical in landscapes too. For instance, this is a good example where uh, this, this researchers here, for instance, they found that pattern landscapes like the spatial structure landscape uh, geomorphology will buffer annual fluctuations. That's another important thing is that, you know, that you have sites that are connected, but there are dynamics that are local. And by having the abilities of species uh, or, or individuals to move from patch to patch, it can buffer those temporal fluctuations that sometimes is stronger in one particular part of the landscape. So it buffers um, uh, sort of this, uh, this uh, stochastic variation that can exist. Um, some, some of them might be deterministic, but for, for a lot of reasons, they, they tend to be um, quite stochastic. And at the end of the day, having uh, these patches being uh, more connected, it, in, it can increase, for instance, biomass productivity because it buffers those local uh, variations uh, from those uh, fluctuations. So spatial movement becomes an extremely important uh, process, not only from the individual point of view, but from population and community uh, as well. So also there's big interest in inhibiting movement, right? Uh, also, this is a very important uh, for management. Uh, for instance, the rabies here for raccoons has been uh, a very, um, one, one, exa one example as zebra mussels too. We know they are very uh, invasive uh, species that we, we tend to, to prevent them from invading to a particular lakes. Uh, uh, ticks moving as a function of climate change coming to Quebec, for instance. Uh, this is also important uh, from epidemiological uh, points of views. Uh, so, so it's important to, uh, sometimes you wanna facilitate movement, sometimes you wanna inhibit movement and those are important uh, things to understand, but we need to understand movement, right? To, uh, to promote or to inhibit. So this, this is very complex at times, particularly now uh, that a lot of uh, managers um, and conservation biologists are thinking about uh, these this different types of ideas, how to promote or inhibit movement depending on, on the problem. So obviously we also have uh, many other smaller um, uh, types of activities, even farming sometimes can uh, affect in many, in many ways uh, uh, population and community dynamics for movement. So I want to talk to you in this first part, why and how to read the landscape. So sort of a general approach, a general statistical approach that, that we've been working and developing throughout the past decade uh, in terms of how we incorporate uh, um, spatial uh, components into any general modeling framework, statistical modeling framework. Then I'm gonna give you an example of spatial genetics. Later on, I'm gonna talk more about biodiversity. Uh, and then I'm gonna illustrate uh, land, using a few landscape vignettes. The first part is a collaboration with, um, with Paul Galpern, who is faculty uh, at Department of Geography at University of Calgary. And interesting enough, Paul and I, uh, he did a master's while I was doing my PhD in Toronto. So yeah, and this was like mid nineties. So you can see sometimes how you know connect connections within programs can generate long-standing uh, uh, collaborations. So our first collaboration was actually in, in around 2013. So it took many years uh, after our our uh, our time together, but uh, but definitely I I feel that uh, graduate programs can can have this um, important feature is to generate those long lasting uh, sort of uh, collaborations and we spend a lot of time discussing about things and I think it's important to uh, to illustrate that when possible. All right, so a little quick uh, ABC of landscape genetics. So as you can imagine, imagine that you have um, this population of moose here and at one point there was, uh, you know, they could uh, they could move uh, freely across this landscape. And at one point, for instance, there was, and as you can see, their, 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 genomic, uh, their genomic makeup is pretty similar, but at one point something happens in the landscape that fissions, the separates uh, groups of individuals that start evolving and not exchanging genes, right? And that is what we refer to neutral spatial genetic variation. And this can have consequences uh, and many, many different levels, including sexual selection and so on, and evolution. So through time, you can find populations differentiating as a result of landscape. And often the question is if this is a fast process or not, particularly because um, um, 
those large uh, uh, fragmentation processes that a human uh, is being uh, driven, driving, it's, you know, in a, it's not for a long, long, long time. So, um, so it's quite recent in many ways, but we can demonstrate that this can actually have important impacts into the population structure. So you have like landscape change, reduces movement, then you have more localized mating, and then there's less gene flow and more genetic drift. And so this is the ABC, uh, the, the simple uh, uh, idea that behind uh, this field that we call landscape genetics and genomics, uh, uh, that basically we use genetic variation information across individuals of of, uh, in terms of their genetic variation. And we can make inferences about what were the sp spatial processes that may have led to that, uh, to that uh, genetic variation or that structuring space of genetic variation. So this, this uh, led to us to develop also uh, tools. Um, I guess everyone is familiar with R and their, uh, their packages that we can develop. So we, we, we we developed this uh, MAM gene, which is pa uh, spatial pattern detection and genetic distance data. But but I'm going to demonstrate this has a lot of uh, uh, general applications. So um, and it's 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 been uh, quite well used. So basically, the idea here is that we have genetic samples uh, through space in, uh, populations or individuals, and we can then model um, the spatial patterns using uh, tools that. I've been participating in uh, in development. So Paul is more of the landscape uh, geneticist here. I'm more of the spatial modeler, and then collaborators that have been working uh, quite a lot on uh, on long-term data, uh, particularly for large mammals in Canada. So, oh, sorry about that. So the idea here is to combine a very general framework for modeling for um, statistical framework for capturing patterns in data. It doesn't matter ecological or any type of data. This can be used in economics and psychology. It's a very general framework. And we, we loosely or more officially depends on, we call them more on eigenvector maps. And so there are, I, I'm gonna go through a little bit of the, the little bit of the math uh, behind that, but we've been exploring uh, this quite a lot. And this math is now have been used in across many different fields. They're coming from geography and ecology basically, but it has been extended to many fields within biology, but also in economics and sociology and different types of methods. This is another interesting part to sometimes be a more uh, focused in quantitative uh, work is because often uh, people will end up um, finding the kind of work you're doing in your field. And sometimes they, they, they will contact you and say, oh, you know, I saw this map. Uh, how do you feel about this uh, being used in this other kind of problem? Maybe history, maybe paleontology, maybe, you know, and so it's quite interesting. Uh, there are many examples of quantitative ecologists in Canada, for instance, working in very different uh, areas. Uh, including uh, collaborations with um, the, the police department, with cities, and so on. I'm not going to give you many examples here, but, uh, but um, there's definitely a lot of them. So those are uh, collaborators that I've been working, Stéphane Dre uh, from um, uh, Sénérest, actually, in, uh, in France. Uh, Pierre Legendre, who is a professor here at University of Montreal, who was my postdoc um, mentor in we kept in touch for many years. Daniel Griffith, who is a mathematical geographer uh, in the US. So a lot of this work has been developed. So the idea here basically uh, is how can we fundamentally base just from a very uh, simple information, which usually is coordinates, right? So we have latitude, longitude, or artificial coordinates, let's call them X and Y. And from this, how do we translate this into a way to build very complex uh, spatial uh, representations of phenomena. So, uh, so the first step in, in this general, there, there are many different steps, but I'm gonna, uh, uh, there, are many, there are many possible steps depending on how complex you wanna uh, make things. I'm gonna present you the ones that are the simplest steps that lead us to already something that we can really work with in terms of modeling spatial patterns. So we start by 
uh, let's say here we have one, two, three, four, five, or nine, sorry. So we have nine, say, sites, patches, or nine individuals. Those could be nine individuals in the landscape, or it could be nine patches, whatever you have positioning. The positioning can be of a lake in a landscape, could be a patch in a forest, or it could be one single individual. Uh, let's say a moose that you, uh, that you uh, for instance, you're tracking uh, individually or, or any individual really, uh, often we track individuals. So uh, whatever the observation unit is uh, for your problem, right? So we start by building uh, uh, Euclidean distance uh, or a geographic distance matrix. This has no, uh, it's, it's quite simple, right? If you use R is one command, <laughs> one line of command using the coordinates. And then what we're gonna do, and this is a very common step in geography and spatial modeling, is that you wanna make your matrix to be uh, what we call parsimonious. So for instance, we know that not every site is connected with every single site, right? Not every individual relates to other individuals in the same way. So we wanna make a matrix uh, that is more, that are, are simplified and often that simplification we relate to make it more parsimonious. But the parsimony, uh, the way we built this can be actually quite complex. Uh, and there are many, many different ways to do that. But the idea here is that your our Euclidean matrix is, as you can see, have many distances here. And at one point, we transform this into a weight matrix. And we would say, well, all the sites, let's say now this is site one. Obviously, site one is uh, um, uh, for many uh, per inferential purposes. We don't say it's connected with site one. It's already site one. So we say it's not connected with site two, not with three, nine, with four, but it's connected with five with a particular weight. So the way we determine whether a site or an observation unit is connected with another observation unit and the weight you provide to say how strong that connectivity is, that in itself can have uh, biological principles, that itself could have statistical principles and that becomes sort of uh, the things that go under the hood. Uh, in a very simplistic way, we could say, for instance, well, uh, I'm gonna transform my, this, this Euclidean matrix here, D, I'm gonna transform that into that actually D between two sides, say one and two. I'm gonna divide, I'm gonna explain to you why we do this four times uh, a particular T, which represents here a threshold. And that threshold, it basically says, if the distance between the two sides is smaller than th that those thresholds, then my distance becomes this. But if it's larger than the threshold, uh, then we basically, uh, we say they're not connected. But there are many ways, again, to build this, right? I'll give you one version. Uh, and so often we can estimate that threshold when uh, using what we call minimum spanning tree which is a, a cluster algorithm that is a lot used by biologists. Uh, but basically we, we have those nine sites here, right? And their coordinates, uh, there are less than nine here, but anyways, don't know why, uh, why I have seven, uh, doesn't really matter. But the point, the point I, uh, I'm trying to make here is that we can build a minimum spanning tree, which basically is the tree that connects at this point with the, minimal amount of sums from this distance. So it's a very simplistic connectivity model, right? Again, uh, to keep that parsimony uh, under, under control, but there are other ways of doing. And from this, we can calculate what is the larger distance that keeps uh, those sites connected. And we can use this as a threshold to rebuild this matrix, okay? Uh, if you're really curious about all the details, like uh, just email me, I'll, I can send you the papers and more details on this. And then what we basically do is that once this matrix of connectivity, so we start with a distance matrix, we simplify that to build a connectivity matrix that we often call W in statistics or uh, in geography. Uh, those are, those are uh, general ways. And then what we do, we extract uh, the eigenvectors, uh, which is a common linear algebra procedure. Uh, and you're going to see the effects of this extraction, what happens. And then we call those eigenvectors here because they are based on uh, um, uh, a connectivity matrix. We just named them eigenvector maps. And we demonstrate uh, that has a deep connection uh, with Moran's eye, which is probably the most uh, 
widely used index to measure spatial structure uh, was developed by Morin. And so uh, we showed that there are algebraic uh, connections between uh, those eigenvectors from this matrix here um, uh, with Morin's eye. So we call the Morin's eigenvector maps just to respect that mathematical uh, link that exists. So, uh, so and then uh, what we end up using is those, as I'm going to give you examples, we use those eigenvector maps that can be implemented in any statistical uh, modeling, actually, uh, as I, I'm going to give you some demonstrations of that. One of the interesting parts, uh, if you're familiar with uh, spatial patterning, so we have the uh, two types of uh, general spatial patterns. We have positive autocorrelation. When sites, when individuals, right, when the observation units, they tend to be more similar in space than you would have expect uh, by chance. However, you can have the opposite. You can have negative autocorrelation. In negative autocorrelation, your units, your observation units tend to be more different for uh, when they're closer in space. So a checkboard, for instance, is a good example, right? You can see a, a, a black square, but surrounded by white squares. And then as you move, there is black and white and so forth. So that's a, uh, that, that would be one example. But what is interesting here is that by actually severing, cutting the connections that we have between sites, uh, we generate what is called a non-Euclidean matrix, right? So we started with a Euclidean matrix, but all of a sudden now what happens here, um, there, it's still positive definite, but what happens here by, by removing some connectivity, we generate what, what uh, a full set of positive eigenvalues and negative eigenvalues. So the eigenvectors that are, are uh, associated to positive eigenvalues, they represent positive autocorrelation. And the, eigen, and the eigenvectors that are associated with negative eigenvalues, they represent negative autocorrelation. So it's a, it's a great tool because it really allows us to model uh, all types of very complex spatial patterns, as I'm going to demonstrate to you soon. And there is that connection that I mentioned to you earlier. If you do a little bit of algebra, we can demonstrate that actually each more and I has a direct uh, link uh, with, uh, with the, with the Morin's I, which generally is represented by I, Morin's I. And that is the, the most universally used. Uh, there's Gary's G, but Morin's I is definitely the most common used in all applications, okay, across all fields. So not only biology, but psychology, sociology, politics, geography, and so on. Uh, even psychologists actually study a lot of uh, spatial patterns uh, as well. Real estate business, they're amazing in terms of uh, spatial modeling. So uh, what is interesting sometimes with the, particularly for the students uh, in the program and postdocs is that sometimes you learn a tool that is so, uh, that allows you to tackle many different problems. I wanna stress this, that's the, one of the beauties of working on quantitative problems. Okay, so I want to give you how uh, uh, in in a, in, in why is doing this in its simplest format. Imagine that instead of having a two-dimensional grid, I may actually have a temporal series. Uh, also, this uh, this this uh, mathematical constructs can also be used to model a complex time series. So imagine you have this data in time and and or in a transect that could be a spatial coordinate uh in a simple transect right so a transect is not a 2d representation is a 1d representation in space uh in a linear uh in a linear way once you extract your morons like back your maps you generate those uh kind of sine and cosine curves this is because uh in in the case where the spatial coordinates are uniform either in a uniform transect or in a lattice uh, I'm going to show you an example of a lattice soon. Uh, what happens at the end is that they become very close to what we define as Fourier decompositions. But the more residing vector maps can be actually built from very, uh, uh, very complex um, um, sampling designs that do not conform to um, to a uniform design, either as a as uh, 1D in a transect or 2D as in a lattice, right? They have been used even in 3D because you could also sample uh, vertically, right? So you could sample uh, in two dimensions plus the, the, the third uh, vertical dimension uh, in, many, in many problems like birds that are, that fly and so on. And it has been used in the past, um, this sort of approaches. 
So the idea here is that when you, when you combine, let's say you have a, a response variable of interest, say genetic data, and you wanna model that as a function of those eigenvector uh, maps, you can see that you know, it can actually combine in a linear way. They are nonlinear, but combined in a linear way, uh, they can actually represent very complex uh, variation uh, in time or space. This is an example in a 2D. Imagine this is a 30 by 30 lattice. I don't put the lattice here, but you, each of them is represented by a little square. And those would be the more uh, eigenvector maps or spatial eigenvectors of, uh, of, uh, of the matrix. So as you can see, they have this very strange uh, behaviors in space, but when we combine them to model a complex, then you can see they can represent really complex uh, variation in space. So what's also interesting using uh, spatial models, and I'm gonna give you a few examples a little later, is that imagine that you start with a response that has some spatial patterning here. Let's say this is the presence or absence of a species or it could be genetic data. And the idea here is that this is the non-spatial intercept only model. So it's the, basically uh, based just on modeling Y as a function of its mean. Uh, but you can see that the residual variation in that model is quite spatial, right? Because the mean is not able to represent that spatial variation. And then what we can do is to add, and there are many ways to do that, that I'm not going to get into many details today, but you can use regularization methods like lasso or, um, or there are many other ones to select uh, the eigenvectors, the, the maps that you, you want to you wanna relate to Y. So basically, you can model this directly as a function of those spatial eigenvectors in any statistical tool. And then the hope here is that then your residuals are no longer spatial. So you may, there, there are many things here that one have to consider. You cannot possibly measure everything that affects the response variable, but many of these things that affect uh, are spatialized. So the hope that at least you can use what we call a latent representation of those missing spatial predictors that potentially uh, led to Y vary in space, right? And then the residual variation will be random. So the advantages of, of the Morris eigenvector maps is that they're easily implemented and we can consider them in any GLM uh, or more complex models. It, they have been used in tree regressions in, uh, if you're familiar with uh, random forests, which is a more uh, uh, general um, algorithm to fit uh, re uh, tree regression models, GAMS, uh, multivariate additive regression splines, artificial net neural networks, uh, <clears throat> discrete non function. So basically, uh, the set of uh, what we call more on eigenvector maps, uh, since its development about 15 years ago, has been used widely by colleges in many different applications. So the other thing, it's an interesting, um, is because there are GLM impl implementations to deal with spatial uh, problems, uh, but, but they become very uh, complex uh, to estimate as the number of observations increase in space. And this is facilitated by using uh, Morin's eigenvector maps. And so we can extend this to very large matrices computationally where the autoregressive model is limited. And it's not only limited by, uh, by the size of the matrix, but also by the algorithms that are used uh, to, uh, to estimate uh, the spatial parameters that are necessary. So this becomes a very general uh, tool, right? And I'm not going to talk about scale decomposition, but there are many advantages over. So under a landscape uh, genetic uh, um, or genomics approach, you have, we can have a, a genetic distance, which is interesting here is that genetic distances is usually squared itself. So for instance, let's say you're comparing a thousand individuals, a fish or moose, and you wanna know what is the genetic uh, resemblance or uh, uh, genetic uh, or distance uh, uh, among every single of those individuals or also sample entire populations for their uh, genetic um, uh, variation and measure what is the variation that exists. But it was interesting is that genetic uh, distance themselves, there are lots of them, uh, but 
they are in itself a squared matrix. So you are modeling a square matrix uh, against those, uh, say, more eigenvector maps. So there are tricks here from the genetics distance. Those are algebraic uh, tricks uh, that have been developed, uh, not by us, uh, but have been developed in the, in the past two decades. Also by ecologists. Ecologists are a fascinating uh, group of quantitative uh, people because we really develop a lot of stuff uh, 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 through, through time. I think it's just part of the field. Uh, epidemiology too is a particular field that there's a lot of development uh, in, um, in, in quantitative frameworks. So basically there is a way that you can uh, algebraically decompose. I'm not gonna get into, uh, and there's some tricks to do that, but those are interested in, so you could either model in this particular, like here, we could model one vector as a response, but you can also model uh, genetic distances or any distances as a response matrix against those uh, more eigenvector maps. So there's a little bit of algebra here that this is all implemented in the package and it allows us to uh, estimate what are the parameters of how genetic variation uh, uh, changes as a function of space. I'm not going to get into many details here, uh, but I will be glad to discuss anytime. So for instance, uh, here is just uh, one particular example. Imagine that just to see what we can, sometimes we can also produce maps, which are very important for conservation and management of populations. So basically we can see here that this, the genomic uh, or the genetic variation of this uh, these individuals or sampling units here are divided mostly into very large uh, uh, clusters of observational units, could be individuals. So one way to understand this is to put this in a, two, a more general, and that's what we call this M or MEM uh, gene uh, package, but it's a more general way uh, to understand the sources of variation in uh, spatial genetic variation or in that D matrix that, that gives us all that. So um, we can use what we call variation partitioning, which is also another set of tools uh, developed by initially by psychologists in the, in the 70s and 80s, and then redeveloped uh, by ecologists in the 90s. And, um, and then in the 2000s, I, I participated in uh, putting this into other uh, different perspectives and uh, also uh, working on implementations of variation partitioning, which is very general, can be used in psychology, economics, has been used uh, tremendously through, throughout the four uh, past decades. Uh, it's just a way to actually characterize data. And we built more robust approaches to do so uh, using ecology as an example, but again, they have been now implemented and used um, back even by psychologists now. So, you know, it originates in psychology, gets uh, ecologists study that problem, then it contributes back. So quantitative methods, again, is the very diverse field that everyone can actually uh, help each other out, right? Because it's just more uh, horizontal in terms of uh, uh, exchanges of knowledge. So imagine that uh, we can then partition in here uh, that, uh, let's say the variation, uh, the genetic variation into say linear distance. So maybe individuals are just moving in a linear way, but we can also measure into long linear ways, which would be then uh, the more on eigenvector maps. So we can, we can model this problem using these two sources of variation. So we can do some simulations to demonstrate uh, th this approach. Uh, this can be done in many ways. Uh, NetLogo is a, it's a well-known uh, framework uh, to simulate uh, movement in landscapes to simulate many other things. We can also write our own uh, functions to do that um, at the time we use NetLogo. So, so just demonstrating here one of the parameters we can use say, uh, you have those the, these individuals in the landscape. So each individual is actually a point in the landscape and uh, they were free to vary, but all of a sudden we put uh, barriers that inhibit movement, right? So in, in, and you can have different levels of movement within uh, those clusters of individuals as well. We can say individuals uh, has a very small agility, move very little or, uh, or has a greater agility uh, and move a lot. And so, um, <clears throat> so one of the, and, and then you let uh, neutral variation through uh, sexual reproduction 
uh, to evolve uh, in this in this population uh, dynamic model here. And so we can consider many different types of um, of structures that may uh, impede uh, or restrict movement, right? So in this particular case for Vigility 15, for instance, uh, our implementation gives explains about 13% of the variation. Doesn't seem to be a lot, but for genetic data in our experiences, it's a pretty powerful method to detect uh, and to model uh, how actually those populations got uh, uh, separated through time. So maybe for instance here, we didn't run the simulation for enough generations that there was still some structure here of this ones. This, this simply represents the predicted values for those individuals. So uh, bigger circles, white, say white is a positive value in the genetic structure. Uh, and, and those are more similar and those are white values and dark values here will be negative. And so they seem to be uh, forming a cluster in a different way. And then we can also build even more. So this, this is a very simple landscape, right? Just divided in three blocks, but we can actually build very complex landscapes and movement patterns using all kinds of models and then use uh, those uh, modeling tools that I just referred to you. So in this particular case here, there's uh, not a lot of variation, uh, but there, we, there's still a, a little bit here that uh, we were able to detect because we simulated the data with a spatial uh, pattern and structure. This is more of a river type uh, 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 isolation. Uh, so uh, in this particular case, so what, one of the interesting is a lot of happens in landscape genetics is the different types of structures that allow uh, individuals to move, to impede movement or to uh, increase movement. Uh, and so it's important uh, to understand if those different types of structures can be also modeled. So here is a pattern uh, in, a, in sort of an S gradient and we are able to, uh, to model really well uh, the genetic uh, population dynamics uh, that happened through time and were simulated. Those are some real examples. So this is polar, um, a polar bear example and the genomics data comes from uh, this paper here by Campania and you know uh, today we share a lot of data right so we can uh, reuse so as you can see here we're able to uh, model um, although we explain only five percent of that variation again one has to understand as we're going to see soon that through time there is variation that is very uh, uh, there is very uh, it's very hard to detect because some, some of the movement uh, is still allows for gene uh, exchanges among individuals and uh, populations and sites, but at the same time, some of the challenges uh, uh, for movement uh, that was driven by human activities, they were recent, right? So there's not enough time, but it's important to, uh, to determine uh, to the extent that that happened. There's another example from the Perry uh, Caribou, uh, in which we're also successful in determining the clusters of uh, genomic variation. Uh, this one is from <clears throat> uh, Arctic char, uh, some call it uh, uh, a trout uh, in, in the Cumberland uh, Sound. So those are the sites. And as you can see, these populations here uh, are um, also already have some genetic uh, variation for their separation in space. Another thing that we developed further is the idea that, well, imagine the following. Imagine that you know the landscape structure in the past. And this often we know through satellite image in the past or from aerial pictures and photographs. So we can use that information in the past. And now imagine that we have the same information. I'm gonna give you examples uh, from today. And we wanna ask ourselves, does the genetic variation that we have today reflects more this, the original structure before human activity, for instance, or more after or a mix of the two? So the tool allows then us to generate evidence. But what is interesting here is that we can do that only having the genetic information of today. Because, you know, imagine you have aerial pictures from the 50s, but there was no technological way that we could measure in any uh, very significant and large scale uh, 
uh, uh, genomic variation uh, among individuals or populations for large landscapes in the past. We can do that in the future, today, sorry. We can do that today and continue to do in the future. But it's interesting that we can actually use the spatial configuration of the past contrast with what the spatial configuration is today and ask if the genomic data we have today fits better with the spatial configuration in the past or today or a mix. And that allows us to provide evidence of how much that change in the landscape through time affected uh, the genetic uh, structure of that uh, species in space, right? So this is, um, this have to, uh, this is a landscape, uh, parts of the, uh, I can't, what is the name of the city? Uh, I can't remember. It's in a particular region uh, in, in, in Saskatchewan where there's a lot of data uh, with collaborators that have been working. So this was the land cover data in 1950s, right? Uh, and you can put algorithms here that we, that in, in, in spatial ecology we call landscape resistance to movement. So there are ways to estimate how difficult it is, for instance, for uh, uh, individuals of woodland caribou to, to cross. Could be water, could be little, uh, could be hills or, or whatever. So they're algorithm. And these algorithms can be then also used to extract more as eigenvector maps. So there are more complex ways to do that. So here is the land cover 1950s and the land cover 2005, right? As you can see, land cover has changed uh, dram dramatically. This has been a very dynamic uh, landscape in 55 uh, years. So we had information from the past, but there's no way you can have genomic uh, structure of uh, this large scale, uh, but we have uh, from here. So again, the question is, does the genetic variation fits best, best with past or present? We also did some simulations uh, in which, in fact, what we do is that we, we simulated data past uh, then we change the configuration uh, for, uh, of the landscape through time and see how the, ge the genomic uh, uh, evolution in that particular uh, happened. And we wanted to detect whether our tools uh, based on genetic variation, Mars eigenvector maps, and variation partitioning allows us to determine whether there's more variation linked to the past, to the future, or a mix of two, right? So, uh, in our particular case here, we can see that in fact, uh, we generate evidence. So this is time one, 1950, and this is 2005, which is time two. So as we can see that there are, uh, the, the genetic variation actually fits more or less equally with past and future. But that allows us to infer how actually the genomic variation, I'm not gonna get into details to get this, but we can also, uh, sorry, it was in Prince Albert, uh, that was the city in Saskatchewan. And so we can infer that in fact, that changes in the landscape in about 55 years changed the, the population, uh, genetic, population structure of uh, woodland caribou. And that's very important. And not, not only that it changed, but how it changed. Because again, it allows us to actually understand on maps using uh, those predicted values from these models uh, to understand how it changed. So it's an interesting uh, way to actually generate uh, ways to think about conservation management, also generate policy uh, for uh, changes, uh, future maybe changes that we need in the landscape for management. So landscape uh, features that resist movement can leave signatures uh, in spatial uh, patterns and neutral spatial uh, um, variation uh, uh, related to genetic autocorrelation, right? Within populations and region, uh, within uh, gene flow. And this has been uh, a really important uh, set of tools that we have developed. And now we have what GenFish, which is a, a network of uh, across the entire, entire Canada in which we're deriving uh, ways to describe genomic variation and use that as management and conservation tools across uh, uh, the water, water bodies of Canada. So this is uh, financed by Genome uh, Canada and Genome Quebec, Genome uh, Ontario. And so this is a really wonderful example of how we actually using these models to put in practice uh, many of those uh, different decision-making uh, uh, toolkits and so on. I think I'm going to stop now. Uh, there are there there are other things I could continue talking, but I think for for the sake of time, 
Uh, one of the things that one day, if you're interested in listening for me again, say you know, in a few years, I'll talk to you about uh, how to predict the future of biodiversity and change the planet using spatial models and uh, how to do this in an effective way that we increase our certainty about how uh, the future, uh, how we can, because we need to, uh, for management purposes and conservation and policy, we need to understand the future uh, and we need to predict the future. And considering a spatial models really uh, increases our certainty uh, in terms of those modeling efforts. And that's one thing that one day, I, that's most of the work I've been doing in the past uh, five years, and that's something uh, that also fascinates me. And it's very much based on those more high vector maps and other spatial tools that we can use. So I'll stop now. And if there's any questions, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to answer or Thank you so it doesn't much. matter. The question doesn't have to be related to the talk. I'm, I'm open to discuss <laughs> uh, uh, any subject, really. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pedro. That was really, really fascinating, and uh, I w I'm realizing I need to read more in, in ecology than I than I have ever done before. We have a question from from Luke. Uh, he's wondering about the directionality of gene flow. <clears throat> Does mem gene assume equal bidirectional migration rates? Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful question, Luke. Uh, in the version I presented to you. It does, but it doesn't need to. We can actually uh, build a connectivity matrix that represent asymmetric uh, variation. Uh, landscape ecologists uh, often consider those in, in their models and we can actually test. For instance, from any, from any square matrix, genomic matrix or spatial matrix, you can decompose in two components. You can decompose one, which we call the symmetric component, and another one, which is the asymmetric component, right? So you're giving weights, for instance, that A is linked to B, but B is not linked to A. And you can do this, and you can imagine that then this can be more complex to estimate. But, uh, but one could ask, for instance, if the genomic uh, variation that we observe fits better with the symmetric component or the asymmetric component, and how? So you could have uh, we could have different uh, uh, different ways to represent this. So and it could become non-stationary in space. So for instance, you could have parts of the landscape in which it's more symmetric exchange of individuals, and parts of the landscape which is more asymmetric. And so for those, you would need uh, even a little more sophisticated way to do it. Uh, but these methods all allow this flexibility to do that. And if you, one day you're interested, it, I, we could have a side conversation and entertain potential ways to do that. And we have a question from Simon. Yeah, um, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, it's really relevant for some of the work we do with Luke actually on trying to understand the spatial patterns in, in humans actually. Um, one question I had trying to wrap my head around what these eigenvalues do um, so the way I understand them is that they, they're a way of um, getting a basis to model variation in space, uh, including in homogeneities in space. But suppose you have like, let's say one little cluster, like one very distinct population in one part of the landscape. Like would that come up as a, as a single eigenvalue uh, that would be able, you know, easy to identify or would that just be a, kind of difficult to interpret yeah, from the eigenvalues so, themselves. Yeah, I see. It depends on the representation you're using, but in general, the first eigenvector will represent very broad clusters in space, and then the combinations are more finer would actually go within subclusters, right? But it also, also uh, often it may depend on how you're defining. Uh, your clusters. Another way to do it that geographers do and statisticians do, we call this reiterative re-weighting uh, feeding. So for instance, you could have a model that you make predictions with that model. I learned that actually uh, people that work on insurance and risk analysis I was invited to give a, a talk once uh, in the stats department at Western. And I discovered they, apparently in insurance, they use a lot of uh, this reiterative uh, method. So basically what you, you do is the following. If you wanna focus on particular aspects of your data, right? You start with a general model, 
and you look at this predictability. And then if you really want to enforce your model to be able to predict the variation that exists between that particular cluster and everything else, you can <clears throat> reiterate to change through the, so you learn, you learn a little bit, you predict it, learning I'm saying here is you predicted that particular cluster, but you still can't make that variation very explicit. So mm -hmm. what if that cluster has that I can now rebuild my, uh, my connectivity matrix and re-extract the Mars eigenvector maps. And you could do that in a iterative way until you actually filter out the types of information you want. Make sense? Yeah, so, oh yeah, there's an entire world out there for us to use it. And they're, again, they're not really uh, necessarily developed. Uh, for instance, I, we have done that before, uh, this reiterative uh, recalculations, but um, it really comes from other fields of geography and statistics. Uh, and so it's a way to actually um, increase our ability to uh, towards prediction uh, and through learning iteratively for the model, right? Because you're refeeding, oh, okay. So for instance, you assumed earlier that there was, um, uh, let's say uh, a connectivity between two sides right? Uh, and that is expressed in your matrix. But through the model fitting, you could actually observe by removing that connectivity, it could also increase your predictability value, your model predictive uh, ability. So, so you can learn, right, from the two sets. You can, re you can learn from the, the, the spatial setting but you can, and, and how it actually connects with the response sets. And so by, by doing this reiterative fitting, you could actually say, well, we're gonna remove this interaction or this connectivity between two sides because this is actually doesn't fit as well with the response. So we keep, might take a couple of days to do it uh, and then you refit it. You can also use Bayesian uh, priors to, to help you out with that. There are many different ways uh, we have used uh, more eigenvector maps also uh, using uh, uh, Bayesian, um, Bayesian approaches, so. Thank you. I'm gonna pose a question of my own here, just with your last slide that you've got up here on the screen, predicting the future of biodiversity. You know, it, it seems to me that what, what I've been hearing so far is about characterizing, you know, spatial patterns in, in existing data. But of course, if you're gonna be predicting the future, you need to, to bring in a little element of uh, uncertainty stochasticity, or I don't know quite what will happen and it could develop in different ways. So does that require um, uh, sort of changing the way you, you construct these, these um, directions, these eigenvectors? Yeah, as it does. So I'm gonna just very quickly here, give you a glimpse of how this looks like. Uh, so one of the things that happens often, for instance, this is a good example. Uh, this particular little bird here in England, uh, that was this was observed in 1970s. Uh, that's a model <coughs> fitted in 1970s, predict the distribution here. Then in 1990s, the species almost disappeared. But using that model fitted in 1970s and using future predictors of climate change, it predicted that will be everywhere. This model was pretty wrong, right? And so one of the other reasons we know for, uh, uh, for this sort of issue is that we know data that is autocorrelated and it's not actually that autocorrelated, that spatial variation that exists in residuals. What it can happen is increase the uncertainty around model estimates. Okay. And that's another way to think about this problem is that not only you want to understand spatial patterning, but we know that spatial models are important to reduce uncertainty in, in model specification. And so sometimes you can get, in average, you're getting the right parameter, but the variation is so high that you've got maybe the parameter here and you're estimating the future and all this is wrong. So what you, what you want to do is to reduce that uncertainty using a spatial specified model and Mars eigenvector maps our general tools that can do that. And then we use this to predict the future. And we have many cases we demonstrate that this allows much better predictivity. 
Another thing that can happen is that you're missing important predictors in a model that allows you to make predictions in the future. And if it, those predictors that are missing in your model are spatialized, then the moral eigenvector maps can actually couch that variation. It can actually, what we call, use that latent vari model, that latent variation that you don't know the origin, but you can definitely reduce uncertainty by doing that. So we have many examples uh, that this, um, this, uh, this can be done. But so spatial representation in models are not only a good way to understand what, how things happen and how they're gonna continue to happen, but it's a huge um, uh, important uh, way to derive models to predict space present and in the future, because we know the spatial patterning, this is something known since the forties, which is interesting that we know that autocorrelated data that is not well modeled, it, it really increases the sources of, of uncertainty. So, it's, it, so it, my point here is it's much, th this is important much beyond only understanding the spatial processes. It is also a, a general way to, 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 um, to build, to estimate better models. Thank you. Other questions from the group? It's totally fine. Uh, we're finishing time, which is great. Yes, exactly. We're right on time. All right. Uh, thanks again, uh, Celia. Well, no, we thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, we thank you. And I actually want to say this is, it was a really wonderful demonstration how a certain idea and concept uh, can be used in so many different areas and domains and uh, how we can yeah, that's, use across disciplines. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Thank everyone. So uh, and I, I hope to see you again in the future in person. <laughs> and if you have any questions along the way, just email me. You can find my name and, and that works. Yes, too. we will. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, Thanks, guys. Pedro. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.